بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم طبعا ده ثالث ميتنج دكتور عمرو يتحفنا بيه بالاكسبيرينس العظيمه جدا انا جوين تو انتروديوس يو ان عربيك دكتور عمرو وبعدين انت في المحاضره يعني ان شاء الله بالانجليزي ما فيش مشكله فطبعا احنا سعداء جدا بوجودك معنا دكتور عمرو يعني ده حاجه بنفتخر بيها جميعا هنا احنا كلنا اصدقائك واخواتك وفرحانين جدا ان انت حاليا بروفيسور اند ميديكال دايركتور ديفيجن اوف نفرولوجي بون اند مينرال ميتابوليزم في يونيفرستي اوف كنتاكي كلنا يعني سعداء جدا والكارير طبعا عشان نوصل لبروف طبعا كانت مع يعني جهاد ومكافحه يعني وكفاح طول السنين سواء في المنصوره ثم في امريكا انا طبعا مش هقرا الكلام ده كله لكن الخبره من خلال مركز الكلى في المنصوره الفتره اللي قضيتها هنا لغايه ما كنت مدرس فاطمه معانا وبعدين في امريكا بدات من من الزيرو لاين عشان تبقى ماشي ستريت بالريزيدنسي والفيلوشيب وبعد كده اسيستنت وبعدين وصلت الفول بروفيسور فاكسبيرنس كبيره جدا ما بين المنصوره تكساس فلوريدا وبعدين حاليا جامعه كنتاكي كاستاذ ممبر شيب لجميع السوسايتيز النفرولوجي ادلت وبيدياتريك اوروبيا ونايت ستيتس فطبعا وريفيور في مجلات كثيره جدا الببليكيشن مور ذان 97 انترناشونال ببليكيشنز ده عمل عظيم جدا وجرانتس وبروجكتس بعضها اكتف وبعضها في البروسيس وبعضها سبونسرد وبعضها نون سبونسرد فطبعا اعمال كبيره جدا الدكتور عمرو طبعا شرفنا في الامريكان سايت اوف نفرولوجي في الكيدني ويك دي صوره من 2016 بمحاضره عظيمه جدا كان هناك والناس كلها يعني بتحتفي بالدكتور عمرو الدكتور احمد دنيا كان مع في الميتنج ده ثم الجمع الغفير الدكتور طارق بعت لي الصوره ديت الدكتور طبعا امجد الباز والدكتور عمرو في النص الدكتور صبري جوهر الدكتور صلاح نجا كل الناس احبابنا موجودين يمكن دي جيرني بعيده شويه دي سنه 96 من 25 سنه وكان هنا الدكتور صبحي معانا شباب خالص اهوت الجنينه والدكتور عمرو كان ايامها طبعا نايب هو طول عمره استاذ من ايام ما كان نايب معانا وده احد النفرولوجي كلابز اللي كان احد طبعا افكار من افكار الدكتور عمرو نعمل منصوره نفرولوجي كلاب لمناقشه الحالات ده برضو قبل ما يسافر امريكا وده مع الدكتور دنيا وحشد من الاصدقاء دكتور احمد حمد دكتور خالد دهشان محمد سعيد احمد عقل ودكتور طبعا هو ودكتور احمد دنيا في المقدمه وده برضه قبل ما يسافر امريكا مع الدكتور صالح نجا والدكتور هاني الوكيل ثم المشوار بقى طبعا ده قصه كفاح كبيره جدا اللي عاوز يتعلم دروس لان الواحد ما يبقى مدرس في الجامعه بتاعته ويرجع تاني يبدا من الزيرو لاين فده محتاج يعني قصه تدرس اليو سي ميل اي من مصر الاجزاء الاولانيه ثم بعد كده كلينيكال تريننج من كندا لامريكا لاوروبا فقصه لغايه ما ماتشنج مع نيابات فده كان في مرحله النيابه والفيلوشيب جه طبعا في هارفارد مع الدكتور انيل شندراكر وبعدين هنا هو دكتور عمرو والراجل هارفارد دوت يعني طبعا الدكتور عمرو اهم من احد الصور الجميله وده في 2008 لما اتقابلنا في الامريكان سوت اوف نفرولوجي فيلادلفيا في تكساس قضيت مع الدكتور عمرو اسبوع من اجمل اسابيع الواحد يذكرها طبعا بريلاكسيشن والصحبه الجميله والحفاوه واعتقد البحيره ديت صوره من الصور الجميله جدا. الدكتور عمرو جالنا هنا يعني مرات زيارات مش كتيرة قوي لكن يعني سابت بصمه خطيره جدا ده كان في 2016 طبعا مع الدكتور ناجي والدكتور علاء والدكتور غاده والجروب كبير جدا انا مش هقول اسماء الناس اللي موجوده بس كلهم كانوا حفاوه طبعا الصوره دي فيها دكتور علاء ودكتور امير عقيلي ودكتور ودكتور نيفين الشخص دكتور نيفين الوقت وكيل الدراسات العليا في طب القصر العيني دكتور خالد عويضه دكتور هندي ياسر هندي في الزقازيق دكتور عمرو في في الزياره دي ادالنا محاضرتين محاضره منهم على البون ومحاضره ثانيه على الستون والاثنين سابوا بصمه كبيره جدا. بعد كده في 2017 ادانا محاضره فعلا فيلوسفيكال ايه الفرق ما بين 2009 و 2017 في الجايد لاينز والانسرتينيتيز اللي اضافتها الستاديز 
لكن كان فيها اكسبيرينس عميقه جدا ويمكن دكتور صبحي في القلب في الصوره ديت مع كل الزملاء دكتور طارق طنطاوي وكل اسم ثلاثه اللي في حاضرين هذا الميتنج. بعد دكتور ايهاب عبد الخالق طبعا دكتور ايهاب نفس الدفعه ودكتور ابراهيم ودكتور طارق فطبعا كلنا بعد كده طبعا مع دكتور اشرف فوده ودكتور ناجي دكتور هشام السيد الدكتورة غادة هي دفعة الدكتور عمرو وهي حاليا رئيسة وحدة الكلى في مستشفى المنصورة الجامعي طبعا والصورة دي بتعبر عن المحبة الكبيرة جدا. أعتقد من الـ من اللاند ماركس إن الواحد أستاذ ويكرمه فأعتقد الصورة دي صورة مهمة جدا إن الدكتور صبح شاف الدكتور عمرو حقق قصة نجاح يستحق التكريم. والصورة دي يمكن الدكتور راغب الرفاعي والدكتور راغب طبعا من الأعمدة اسم البطنة وكان له لمسات في الامتحانات والكلام ده فالصوره دي فيها ذكريات طبعا هنا في دكتور منتصر ودكتور هاله بالاضافه لفريق اسم ثلاثه دكتور علاء ودكتور غاده ودكتور محمد كمال دكتور محمد ممدوح اللي معانا ودكتور عماد يعني الناس كثيره جدا من محب الدكتور عمرو محمد ممدوح برضو من الناس المجتهدين هنا دكتور سعيد خميس موجود الدكتور طارق طنطاوي ثاني اهوت صور جميله مع فريق من هنا الدكتوره داليا ودكتور طبعا تعزمنا الدكتور مجدي الشرقاوي في عين شمس كان هو صاحب المؤتمر وسعدنا جدا بالمحاضره الدكتور عمرو قدها عن البون وازاي الفرماكو دايناميك وازاي الاوستو بلاست والاوستو كلاست والفيديو التاريخي اللي الدكتور عمرو عرضه في هذا اليوم طبعا موجود الدكتور كمال والدكتور سمير والدكتور سعيد كاتشير بيرسونز للجلسه دي مع ناس محبين كتير جدا للدكتور عمرو هنا يمكن الدكتوره مي والدكتوره هامل العجان ظهر اهوت في الصور وكل الحبايب دكتور احمد يعني مش عاوز اقول اسماء واسيب اسماء الحاجه الجميله في الدكتور عمرو هو الكرم الضيافه يعني انا قلت الاسبوع اللي رحته في تكساس معاه كان من اسبوع يعني يعني قمه الحفاوه كل زمايله اللي راحوا معاه يعني الصوره دي من احد يعني الدكتور احمد دنيا اللي بعتها لي يعني سيمبل للابريشيشن على كرم الضيافه ونفس الكلام دكتور طارق بعت له الصوره ديت فدكتور عمرو راجل كريم وكلنا بنحب الدكتور عمرو في الفيرشوال اكاديمي انا عملت سيرش لقيت في خمس محاضرات وخمس فيديوهات موجودين على اليوتيوب انا رفعتهم للدكتور عمرو اخرهم طبعا الاثنين دول اللي هو الفيرست بارت والسكند بارت من سلسله رينا اوس ديستروفي والنهارده يبقى الثيرد بارت الفيديو ده مثلا شافه 1500 واحد وطبعا ابريشيشن للفهم الكبير ده اكتر من 800 واحد 833 والنهارده ان شاء الله هيبقى طعم تاني لانه هيتكلم على الاول المحاضره ثم هيناقش حالتين الدكتور عمرو للاسف الباوربوينت يعني عاكسنا شويه لكن اعتقد البي دي اف هيبقى فيه الكفايه ان شاء الله واهم من البي دي اف والباوربوينت هي الاكسبيرينس والدماغ احنا سعداء جدا بالدكتور عمرو الحسيني وبالأصالة عن نفسي وعن الجمعية المصرية الأمراض وزراعة الكلى شعب التعليم والطب المستمر وكل الناس اللي موجودين معانا طبعا احنا معانا حبايبنا من الدول العربية يعني قبل ما قبل ما ابدا البرزنتيشن كان معانا الدكتور فيصل شاهين من السعودية طبعا غير الأصدقاء والزملاء والأساتذة اللي من مصر. احنا متشكرين جدا لوجودك معانا دكتور عمرو ونتمنى إن شاء الله تبقى حلقة مفيدة زي الحلقتين اللي اللي فاتوا وإن شاء الله تبقى تكملة للمسيرة لأن احنا عاوزين ننهل من خبرة حضرتك العلمية إن شاء الله مرارا وتكرارا بإذن الله شكرا وهقفل السلايد بتاعتي وهبدأ أعمل شير للبدء اف بتاع الدكتور عمر شكرا جزيلا دكتور حسين هل تسمعني أوكي؟ أنا سمع كويس بس أنا مش عارف أوصل للبدء اف الأول افتحه ولا اعمل ايه يا ممدوح؟ ستوب شير اهو المفروض يفتح معايا انا مش عارف اوصل له ليه ده اهو شايفه يا دكتور عمرو دلوقتي؟ دكتور عمرو شايفه ولا مش شايف حاجه؟ نو اي اونلي سي يور ديسك توب يعني مش شايف البي دي اف في اول سلايد عليها رينا ديستروفي؟ لا طيب انا هعمل هقفل ده تاني اهو ستوب شير شير سكرين 
اعتقد كده بان Yes. This is a disclosure. Okay, very good. Is I need to make a statement. I'll need to follow. I'm with you. 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 I'm Direct senior is one year ahead of me, and he was started uh, in the Mansoura Regis Center, uh, I think, two years before me. So I had the pleasure uh, and the honor to learn directly from him, of course, from others, many, many, uh, including, you know, our professor Sob, who, you know, we are all students, and whatever, everything we are doing in our career is just um, goes back to Dr. Soh because he is the one who uh, teach us from the beginning how to be, I think, good doctor and researcher and uh, how to raise our bar in our life uh, to be, um, you know, a good person. If you allow me, Dr. Amr, of course, I 100% agree about this point. We are lucky in the nephrology community that we have uh, uh, the Professor Muhammad Sobh, because this is the role model that we follow his Absolutely. steps. Alhamdulillah. Okay. Absolutely. Um, can you make it a little bit bigger? Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, today is uh, we are going to discuss the third uh, lecture in the renal osteodystrophy uh, theories that uh, uh, Dr. Hassin invited me to share. A couple of months ago, I think we have uh, one. The first session was in March or April, then the second was in the first week of May, and now we are in the third week of July. And uh, today I'm going to try to, uh, you know, close this session. Of course, it's very hard to do that. It's a very, you know, um, rich field that I cannot stop or, you know, cover. Uh, just in um, three sessions. Um, so today I'm going to focus on uh, how to treat uh, the renal osteodystrophy non-pharmacologically and we'll uh, discuss a little bit also some pharmacological intervention. Then I'm going to discuss uh, just clinical cases uh, with some of the trainees and try to get your experience how to manage uh, our patients with uh, CKD, MBD, and renal osteodystrophy. Um, disclosure, I don't have anything to disclose. I don't get any money from the pharmaceutical company uh, related to bone. I just uh, have some multi uh, um, randomized clinical trial, multi center trial um, funded by pharmaceutical company, but both are unrelated to the bone field. The objective of this presentation is to discuss, focus mainly on non-pharmacological intervention. And uh, in the last two sessions, the first one, we covered the diagnostic uh, challenges and uh, the renal osteodystrophy. The second lecture, we covered mainly how to treat low turnover bone disease. This lecture, we are going to focus mainly on the little bit high turnover bone disease and non-pharmacological intervention. Uh, then uh, I'm going to discuss the management approach. So uh, we have, for some reason, we have as physician, we are more focused on pharmacological intervention. However, as physician, you know, yeah, many, many years ago, physician is uh, more focused on, not only on chemicals and medications, but also on lifestyle, diet, exercise, non-pharmacological interventions in general, decrease the chances of getting the disease by preventing it with better quality of life 
rather than treat diseases with pharmacological intervention with chemicals and medication. So I'm going to focus on non-pharmacological. Then Dr. Hussein, I think he has a lecture coming in the next couple of weeks. He's going to talk about state control, vitamin D, uh, analogs, vitamin D receptor agonist, calcium metrics. I'm not going to mention this today. Then I will mention a little bit uh, something about anti-osteoporotic medications in dialysis beta and CKD. And as you know, we discussed the anti uh, the osteoanabolic medications in the previous uh, two sessions. So today we'll talk about anti-reservative therapy and non-pharmacological approach. As you know, next please, uh, anti-reservative medications include mainly four categories. Bisphosphonates, denosumab, which is rank L, like GAND, monoclonal antibody, select, selective estrogen receptor modulator, and calcedon. Osteoanabolic, we discussed it before, includes mainly teriberatide, abaloparatide, and the romosozumab, which is monoclonal antibody against uh, sclerosis. However, bone loss in TKD patients is not only due to hormonal disturbances, vitamin D deficiencies, secondary hyperbara, but also because of other comorbidities such as myopathy, neuropathy, malnutrition, inactivity. All of these doesn't only induce bone loss, but also induce muscle weakness, sarcopenia, increase the chances of falls and the fracture. So the non-pharmacological approach doesn't only focus on improvement of bone quantity, but also focus on improvement of bone quality and also improvement of the neuromuscular function. So it reduces falls and improves the chances of fractures. In our patients with CKD, they have sarcopenia. Sarcopenia is getting more attention in the last uh, uh, one or two decades because it's associated with increased morbidity and mortality. It causes functional limitation to our dialysis patient and it causes disability. And of, you know the net result is virility and increased mortality. What exercise does is it helps people to build a bone and also if you are more active, your bone will be healthier. If you have healthier bone, you will be more active. So it's bi-directional. Having healthier bone will help you to be more active and being more active will allow you to have healthier bone. Bone health has a major effect, not only on bone, but also on quality of life. It doesn't only decrease the chances of fracture, but also improve the patient's performance, the patient's quality of life, the patient's activity. So instead of our patient will be dependent on others, he can be independent and actually can help others as well. Exercise. Has, there is different uh, types of exercise, but weight-bearing exercise is the most important kind of exercise when it comes to improvement of bone quantity and quality. High-impact exercise, especially in the childhood or early in our life, increase the bone mass and increase the peak bone volume our bone is like bank account. You are either adding to your bank more bone when it comes to the bone bank or losing bone so you are taking money out of your bank. So during the childhood and the childbearing period, we are building our bone till age of 25 to 30, we reach our big bone volume we reach our maximum account in our bank. 
Then after this, we start to lose some bone. Again, we can make our bone stationary as it used to be in our best time life, which is you know 25 to 30 years of age, or we can lose bone. Most of people, they start by losing about 0.5 to 1% of their bone at this age of 30. Then after that, especially after you know postmenopausal in females, they start to lose about 1 to 2% every year. Next, please. There is a video if you can. Uh, I don't know. Probably you're not going. Uh, it will not work. Yes. Able. Right. Oh. Okay. So anyway, you remember these kind of chickens. These kind of chickens, you, we call it here free ranch chicken. This is all the chicken that we used to eat when we uh, was, you know, younger, 30 years ago, I don't know, 40 years ago or 20 years ago. Now, these kind of chickens are replaced by different kinds of chickens. This kind of chicken, they have very strong bones. You remember, they were very delicious because they exercise all the time, because they are active all the time. They are free in the farm. They don't put them in batteries or cages. So they are also challenged all the time to eat and to run and to show up their strength. So this makes uh, their bone very strong. This makes also their muscles very strong. So if you eat them, they are very delicious. Usually it takes for to cook this kind of chicken uh, about a couple hours at least because their bone and their meat are tough. But, next slide, the recent kind of chicken, now they are raising a chicken just for to save money. They are raising these kind of chickens they are putting thousands of these chickens in cages and in batteries and they just feed them all the time so instead of having them ready to be slaughtered in three months they can do this in 35 to 40 days so this saves them a lot of money however and they don't allow them even to have any sun exposure they just feed them all the time to be bigger. And what happened is, you, if you want to cook this kind of chicken, it doesn't take more than 45 minutes to make it well done with cooking, with boiling, because their bone, their muscle are soft. They are not tough, they are not hard. They have very weak bone. Even if you see them, while they are standing, they cannot stand up. They cannot raise their head. Usually their head is down because they are weak. Their bones are weak. One of the main reasons of this is because they are not a challenge. They don't have even a space to move. They don't fight with each other. They don't see the sun. Same thing for humans. If you bought me in a cage, if you prevent me from being active, being in the sun and outdoor, you will see the same result. Next slide, please. You remember in the past, humans, you know, 10,000 years ago or more, we didn't use to live in this small apartments or houses, you know, live in cars, stay away from sun. We were active all the time. We were having active exercise and the mobility and ambulation and fighting, you know, even to get food and to get drink. We have to be exposed to the sun. We have to run. We have to be active. Now our lifestyle change. I just wonder if you compare our bone to this kind of, you know, these guys thousands of years ago, I'm very sure that they have much tougher bone, much healthier bone compared to us because now we are in the sedentary life. Everybody is on his laptop or his smartphone and just you know stayed in his office. Even with this pandemic, 
our ambulation, our activity, everything now we are doing it. You are doing it remotely from home or, or from your office. Next, please. So exercise is very important. It's physiological, it's natural. Okay, let us focus now on what happened in our patients. See this interesting, uh, you know, analysis of all published articles between 2005 to 2006 to 2015. These are all the studies that has been published in this 10 years that evaluated the importance or the impact of physical activity on health. And as you see here, among from more than 1,700 articles that was published, only seven were published in patients with kidney disease. And as you see the title here, physical deterioration of dialysis patients ignored L-reported and L-treated. They didn't even say under-reported or under-treated. It's L, it's sick, it's bad. As a nephrologist, we don't focus on our patient physical deterioration or physical activity. And of course, this has negative consequences. Apart from, you know, thousand articles published, we only can find, hardly find four articles apart from thousand articles. Most of physical activity are focused on patients with stroke, arthritis, cancer, lung, but not on patients with renal disease. They usually exclude patients with renal disease. Next. Then there are some small studies. So even this seven studies, when it comes to nephrology, we have very small studies. The first one that you see is, you know, all of them are, you know, small sample size, small number of patients. This study, they, you know, examined the impact of intradialytic aerobic cycling exercise in 40 dialysis patients, and they did that only for three months. And as you see here, in three months, the BMD for the group uh, e, uh, which are the exercise groups, they have much less bone loss compared to group C, which is a control group. Again, only you can see this in three months. You remember to see impact on bone with most of medication, you usually need to give this medication at least for a year or two. When you see the publication, you know, when they examine the impact of bisphosphonates or you know, denosumab or teriberitide or others, usually at least one, two, three, or four years of follow-up. You don't see this in three months, but just with exercise, something you can do in your dialysis clinic. Bring up a cheap cycler or ergometer, then allow the patient or encourage the patient to use these kind of uh, uh, you know, devices that can help to build up their bone. And of course, it has much, much uh, more benefit beyond the bone on heart, and muscle, and depression, you know, psychomotor uh, activities and everything else. Another study that also examined uh, the impact of exercise on BMD, see the numbers here, 10, patients in the exercise group, 11 patients in the control group. Again, this is six month follow-up study. And as you see, the fever head was better for the exercise group compared to the control group. Okay, other study, as you uh, may see in a second here, in hemodialysis patients, they said enterodialytic resistant exercise improve osteoblast function. And this is a pilot study on how many patients? Only 13. I'm very sure each of us are seeing, you know, 
tons of dialysis vision. Vision with CKD. Why not to focus on this kind of very simple physiological intervention rather than to focus on very expensive medication that is not always safe to give and uh, tolerability and safety profile usually is not very good. Especially, again, you need to give the medication for a long time. Here, only eight weeks of, you know, including 13 patients, very small study uh, for very short duration. And you can see here the bone-specific alkaline phosphatase was much better for the exercise group. This means that this patient probably improved the bone formation. The last study I'm going to mention here, it's not only about improvement of DMD or improvement of bone formation rate, but also you can control the phosphorus. You know that we are giving tons of phosphate binders, you know, calcium beads, non-calcium beads, and most of the study, they have some concerns, safety concerns with using this medication, especially when it comes to cardiovascular calcification. Here, something you can do very safe, to uh, improve the phosphate clearance and removal of phosphate during dialysis. We only analyzed 22 patients who used cycler you know, ergometer for one hour during dialysis. And as you can see in the next slide, that the phosphate removal rate was much higher in patients who were subjected to the exercise intervention. You can remove more than 1,300 milligram per session of phosphate only with the uh, exercise. Then you can skip the next slide because it's a video, then go to the slide after that. So sarcopenia, as I mentioned, it's getting more attention now in dialysis patients as we talked about bone, there is bone formation and bone resorption. When it comes to the muscle, there is always a state of muscle degeneration and muscle regeneration and growth. In our CKD patients and dialysis patients, there is increased muscle degradation because of inflammation, malnutrition, rat system stimulation, decreased insulin like growth factor one, increase of abnormal protein and vitamin D insufficiency or deficiency. On the other hand, also, there is decreased muscle regeneration because of the hypogonadism, because of the bad um, proteins and mitochondrial dysfunction and physical activity. This is a vicious circle. So this will induce more physical inactivity and this you know, physical inactivity also will induce more muscle breakdown and decrease muscle regeneration. Then the impact of this, next slide, on survival, several studies showed that patients who had sarcopenia, they die earlier than others. Okay, you can go to the next slide. And the question is, what ex exercise do to the bone? at the biological level, at the cellular level. And Dr. Hussein can share, if you want to unmute uh, some trainees so we can open the, some discussion. I showed you that exercise is important to bone. It helps bone formation. It decreases bone resorption. And it's good not only for bone, because it's also increased BMD, enhance phosphate removal during dialysis. And beyond this, it has many, many, you know, uh, good aspects, especially on the heart and the muscles. So who can answer me? What do you think on the cellular and, the, you know, biological level? What happens uh, when you exercise? How can this impact your bone? So if, we, if any one of uh, the attendees wants to uh, interact with Professor Amr, please raise your hand. Please raise your hand to unmute you to discuss with Dr. Amr. So we can, we can select one of... Uh, 
دكتور هاني منصور دكتور هاني دكتور هاني so it seems that there is a problem in the sound with Dr. Haney. Okay. So, Muhammad Mamdouh. Dr. Muhammad. Yes. Dr. Muhammad, yes. Uh, so, uh, I think that uh, exercise can improve the MI, improve the MD, reduce inflammation, uh, maybe reduce oxidative stress, uh, can may stimulate uh, bone uh, like uh, formation. How does it stimulate bone formation, Mando? And you know that we discussed, by the way, Mando is very active, he's uh, doing research with me for uh, several months now and has a lot of achievement, he's a very smart guy. So, Mando, how can exercise improve your bone at the uh, cellular and physiological level? I think that uh, it, it affects sclerostin, which is one How of, does it uh, affect sclerostin? Uh, I think it, uh, it inhibits sclerostin level with exercise. How does it affect, uh, you know, or inhibit sclerostin? Uh, Okay, don't let, let, me, let me take over here. Okay, so our bone need to be stressed all the time because we have something called mechanoreceptor or st stress sensors in our bone. And these are the osteocytes. Osteocytes, if you are moving, even if you are moving your arms, while you are sitting or moving your legs. It's better than if you don't move at all while sitting. Even with gravity, if you are raising your hand or if you are using your pen to write something, you stress your bone. Of course, with bearing exercise has the most important effect and the most benefit you can get is from weight bearing exercise when you run or you know when you play soccer or when you uh, do uh, you know go to the gym and have some weight lifting? All of these challenge your bone. It stimulates your osteocytes. And if you don't do this, especially on our CKD patients, they have osteocyte dysfunction. Osteocyte. When you have osteocyte dysfunction, it starts to secrete more sclerostins, and the sclerostin inhibit wing signal, so sclerosin comes out from the osteocytes and it has receptor on the osteoblast service. So it goes to the osteoblast and it inhibit wing signaling. Wing signaling is very important in bone formation. So if you inhibit uh, the wing signal by having more sclerostin, especially our CKD patient have very high levels of sclerostin, and if they are immobilized or inactive, they have higher levels of, of sclerosis that inhibit bone formation. It's all about osteocyte dysfunction. And the osteocyte is the brain cells of the bone. It's the stress sensor, it's a mechanoreceptor. If you don't stimulate your bone, if you don't stress and challenge your bone, osteocyte dysfunction will happen and will decrease the bone formation rate through secreting more sclerostin that inhibit wing signal. So this is just, you know, as this is the reason that we treat uh, our patients with blood bone turnover by giving sclerostin, mon you know, monoclonal antibody against sclerostin. We discussed this before. Very good. But you don't have to give expensive monoclonal antibody. If you just exercise, if you ambulate, if you encourage your patient to be more active, you can help to increase bone formation rate. Next, please. Okay, another thing I want to discuss also for non-pharmacological intervention of bone and renal osteoporosis is some approach. So first is exercise, I think we covered that. And again, I am biased here, so maybe I'm you know, a little bit 
you know, biased against the pharmacological intervention. We'll come and speak a little bit about it. But, you know, these kind of non-pharmacological intervention, it's not, uh, you know, toxic. You can not ever get toxic from, you know, doing exercise or, you know, having some tonic exposure or eating healthier, you know. Uh, so other, all the pharmacological intervention, especially these days, we are playing with hormones. We just, you know, discuss the romosuzumab or dinosuzumab or even the you know, teribaratide or baloparatide or sinacalcid. All are, of these, you know, medication, they work on hormones. Even the sinacalcid, right? It works on the BTH receptor and the BTH is a hormone. And playing with hormone as the, our pharmacologists, you know, the pharmacology professor used to teach us Playing with hormone is like playing with fire. And we don't even know too much how does this, you know, hormones work. This hormone was, you know, most of them were just discovered less than, you know, half century ago or something. It's not like uh, something we know forever. And every day we discover more about these biological agents and these, uh, you know, uh, hormones. So whatever we know right now about these hormones is much uh, less compared to what we ignore. But when it comes to sun exposure or exercise, I think we know uh, because it's physiological, it's just a natural thing. As Egyptians, and uh, I think most of the audience here are Egyptians, sun exposure is very important. You remember when they found the Egyptian mummies, they found intact skeleton. And when compared to the Persians or to the North Pole of, uh, you know, this earth, the skeleton cannot be reserved for a long time. Of course, the ancient Egyptians used to, you know, use very sophisticated technique to preserve their mummies. But also, you know, archaeologists said, the skeleton of the old, you know, ancient Egyptians are very strong compared to other mummies and other skeletons. One of the main reasons for that is because Egyptians used to have more sun exposure. You remember the old picture of the Egyptians, they are they having darker skin and they don't put anything on top of their head. And usually even they don't wear a lot of clothes. Their, their bodies are exposed to the sun most of the time. Compared to our, you know, other nations, they used to cover their bodies, especially in the colder countries. Of course, the sun exposure is, is less and they cover their body because it's cold. As Egyptian, we are one of few nations who worship the sun god, you know, Ra. I am not promoting for that, but Egyptians, they, you know, probably overestimated the importance of the sun and they made one of the strongest and most important gods they worship were the sun god, Ra. Up till now, I think we are celebrating that the sun uh, goes perpendicular on the face of uh, Ramses II in Abu Simbel uh, twice a year, I think one time in October 22nd and February 26th. We understand as Egyptians the importance of sun. So I don't know what happened to us in the last, you know, couple uh, decades. Every single time I go to Egypt, people say, okay, we have vitamin D deficiency. How do you treat vitamin D deficiency? Why do we have this vitamin D? because I think part of this is we don't get enough sun exposure. We are trying to hide from the sun all, all the time. Now we have this high, you know, tall buildings and everyone is living in apartments. He doesn't see the sun. And we are trying to do most of our activities indoor. We try to avoid outdoor activities, especially in summer. When I go to Egypt to visit, most people in summer, they uh, sleep in the morning and they wake up all night long to oh. avoid sun. This is 
something that might have, you know, uh, uh, deleterious effect and bad impact and bad consequences on in our life compared to our ancient Egyptian. Next slide, please. So, um, sun exposure is very important. We know that one of the major sources of vitamin D is sun. Uh, there is three uh, sources of vitamin D to our body. As you know, from the food, we can take either vitamin B2 or vitamin B3, so ergocalciferol or polycalciferol, you know, according to the source, is it uh, animal or plant? But also we have the third source, which is from the skin. We have the seven dehydrocholesterol and the sun. We have mainly two ultraviolet radiation one is ultraviolet A and ultraviolet B. Ultraviolet A have um, longer uh, wavelength, so it induces tanning and sun burning. Ultraviolet B has shorter wavelength and actually it activates the ergocalciferol, the 7-dehydrocholesterol uh, that goes to the liver and activated through the 25 hydroxylase. Then it goes to the kidney and uh, the one hydroxylase enzyme, it changes that you know, from the 25 to 125 dihydroxy polycalciferol. So it changes the vitamin D from the calcidol to calcitriol, which is the active form. Okay, it, here this um, you know, diagram shows you if you are living in a sunny state in America, and if you are wearing short, you can only get your you know, vitamin D requirement by having seven minutes exposure to the sun. Just seven minutes outdoor, you know, doing whatever you want, walking, exercising, you know, um, doing anything in you know, your balcony or you know, having you know, tanning uh, shower or something. Seven minutes give you your requirement. Of course, if you are Whiter, if you have whiter skin, you will need less time compared to darker skin. Again, if, if you are in a colder state, it needs more time. Age also is a factor here. But I'm saying that you can get most of your vitamin D requirement just by having sun exposure. The previous study, can you go uh, to the previous study, Dr. Hussein, please? The previous study can show you that you can get up to 10,000 international units of vitamin D by sun exposure. You see the statement um, in the previous slide, up to 10,000 units of vitamin D you can get from the sun exposure. The other good thing in sun exposure, you don't get toxic. Did you ever hear about somebody can have hypervitaminosis B or hypercalcemia because you know, a lot of sun exposure. No, you don't. And maybe Dr. Hussein can open this for discussion. Why, if you take ergocalciferol or polycalciferol, a lot of uh, these supplements, you can get hypercalcemia, you can get hypervitaminosis D, and we know the consequences of that. But you don't do that uh, from getting vitamin D from the sun. Even as the previous study mentioned, you can get up to 10,000 units every day from proper uh, sun exposure. If you are getting 10,000 units of cholecalciferol or ergocalciferol a day, probably you will get you know, some toxicity from vitamin D. Why this doesn't happen when you get it from the sun, physiologically or naturally? Mawatasim, Dr. Hussein, can you un unmute them? One of them or two? Dr. Muhammad Husni. Dr. Mawatasim, unmute yourself, Mawatasim. Can you hear me? 
محمد محمد حسني ايس ممدوح اوكي ايس اي دونت نو فور شور بات اي ثينك ذات اور بودي كان ريجوليت ذا اماونت اوف فيتامين دي ويتش كان هي ابسورب فروم ذا سن بات اف وي جيف هيم جيف ذا بودي ارجو كارسبور اور سم ذا بودي كانت ريجوليت ذس اماونت ابزوربشن ان ذا جات يو مين Yes, maybe it is. It can, yes, it can. It can regulate it, but not to the same extent. It can regulate the uh, uh, the amount who, who could uh, absorb from the sun or who could activate using the sun. Okay, it's it's good thinking. The first part is, is at least uh, right, but it needs uh, some trimming. So, if, if anybody else wants to answer it. Uh, so he can it's, go for it's, it. It's better to go ahead. Better go. Okay. Okay. So actually, our skin has the capability of turning off, uh, you know, the excess vitamin D and changing the excess of vitamin D to inactive compounds. It's in the skin. But if this goes to the liver and the liver activates it, then go to the kidney and activates the active form, it's beyond, you know, inactivation it's already activated and you can have toxicity and this has happened from overdosing when you take supplements but this doesn't happen because the skin itself can shut down the activation of the seven uh, dehydrocholesterol so it doesn't go to the liver and it's not active it's just change the excess uh, you know amount to an inactive compound very good Okay, let us talk about the sun. It's very important. You can, you can get very good amount of vitamin D through the sun. Here is an interesting study, again, when it comes to study of CKD vision and uh, the impact of exposure to the sun and in dialysis vision, CKD vision, you will not find a lot of studies. But here, very interesting study that they examine the impact of the ultraviolet B radiation in 95 patients uh, and also they um, did um, you know uh, ultraviolet B radiation to dialysis patients so they compared if you give uh, around 35,000 international units of vitamin D every week they compared the impact of this to uh, giving ultraviolet B radiation over six months so both group, if you get vitamin D, 35,000, if you give it to the dialysis patient, you will increase the vitamin D level, the 25 vitamin D level, by about 60%. In the other group who had ultraviolet irradiation, the vitamin D level went up fourfold, so 400% compared to 60%. On the other hand, they did gene expression analysis and they found that there is improvement of the vitamin D receptor and also in improvement of 1 hydroxylase and 25 hydroxylase um, enzyme. So the gene analysis also is better, you know, if you do ultraviolet radiation compared to the vitamin D supplements. So still, compared to sub supplementation, you can get better effect and safer with less or no toxicity. Other way that you, you can also improve your bone health is through taking vitamin D, natural vitamin D, uh, so, you know, resources uh, in your food. As you see here, three ounces, three ounces is equal to about 90, gra 90 grams of salmon fish gives you about 570 international units of vitamin. Same for tuna, if you eat three ounces of tuna, which is less than 100 grams, it gives you about 240 international units of vitamin D. Sardines give you 165, then milk, yogurt, orange uh, juice, cereals, and um, boiled egg are all good sources for vitamin D. So food, especially, you know, the fish, salmon fish, sardine, tuna, and milk and milk products are very important, uh, you know, sources of vitamin D. You don't have 
to go to the pharmacy. Why do you like to go to the pharmacy and to get vitamin D supplements? You can just improve your vitamin D uh, through increasing sun exposure, through exercise, and through eating healthy. Next, please. Then, also, the organic sources of vitamin D. Uh, there is a lot of uh, conversation nowadays about you know, the non-animal sources of vitamin D are better compared to the animal source of vitamin D because it doesn't induce uh, any acidic environment and as you know, acidic environment is bad for the bone. So squash, uh, red pepper, uh, spinach, um, you know, beans, uh, sesame, bananas are all good sources not only for vitamin D, but also for calcium. Okay, so another thing also you can prevent bone loss, next please, by uh, encourage smokers to quit, to stop smoking. Several studies show that smokers, they have bad bone health, they have unhealthy bone, and uh, they, there is increased risk of hip fracture and other uh, major bone fractures compared to non-smokers. Also, next please, there is other studies showed that non-smoker had better uh, bone turnover biomarker when it comes to bone formation biomarker and bone resorption biomarker. So, uh, you know, the BAPs, the bonus physical alkaline phosphatase is higher in non-smokers. This indicates better bone formation. And the TRAP 5B is, is higher in the smokers, so they have more bone loss. Vitamin D level is much higher, you know, the, the uh, lower corner on the right-hand side, you can see that vitamin D levels are much better in uh, uh, the non-smoker compared to smokers. Also, next please, when it comes to phosphate control in dialysis patients, several studies show that smokers, you know, men and women, they tend to have higher serum phosphorus level in CKD stage three and four and also in dialysis patients. So you can also control the hyperphosphatemia by helping your patient to quit smoking. Next, please. So uh, this, we are doing a study, and Mamdouh is part of this study. He's actually the one who did this analysis. And uh, as you can see on the left side, that activation frequency, which is a marker of bone resorption, it's, uh, so these um, people are CKD stage 2 to 5, not on dialysis yet, and they have low turnover bone disease. So smokers, they had more low turnover bone disease compared to non-smokers. So smoking in, can induce, this is a, a game association study, but we, uh, our hypothesis is smoking can induce more low turnover bone disease in CKD. And of course, on the right side, you can see smokers, they have much higher cardiovascular calcification. You know that our patients, they die because mainly of the cardiovascular disease and cardiovascular calcification. So smokers have much higher, you know, five or six folds higher uh, agaston scores, you know, in the coronaries and in the uh, aorta compared to non-smokers. Okay, I, I think I will stop by here and then we can discuss two cases uh, because also of the technical problem. I don't know if you can see the slides well or not. So um, first case, so we have, um, we can give maybe about 10 to 15 minutes to discuss uh, every case. We will discuss it a little bit in details. And these are not like, you know, a case uh, reports or, you know, very rare cases. They are cases that we can see every day and we have challenge or dilemma in either diagnosis or management. So case one, as a 64-year-old female uh, who had a history of uh, a long-standing 
uh, hypertension and she is on dialysis for a long time. Recently, she moved uh, uh, to your uh, dialysis unit and was evaluated for uh, her renal osteodystrophy. Uh, you thought that she might have a dynamic bone disease because her PTH level was on the lower side. It ranged from 2.5 to 54. So her PTH was in the lower side. She had mild increased serum uh, calcium levels and she, her alkaline phosphatase level ranged from 149 to 196. And she had a BMD by DEXA that, that showed severe osteoporosis. This is a dialysis patient with severe osteoporosis, low IBTH, and mild hypercalcemia and serum alkaline phosphatase is mildly elevated. So what do you think? How would you approach this patient? Next slide, please. The medication uh, that this patient is taking is calcium acetate, very uh, usual, you know, calcium is a phosphate binder or lowering agent, calcitriol, epogen, IV, IR, biotin, and uh, carvedilol and amlodipine for blood pressure. Next, please. So what do you uh, want to do next for this patient? You have a dialysis patient. A lady was on dialysis for a long time. And now she moved to your city. And now you're taking care of her in your dialysis clinic. And her BTH is on the lower side. And she had mild hypercalcemia, severe osteoporosis. So I, I prefer here, Professor Amr, just to uh, give uh, uh, all the attendees the right to, to, to comment on the case. Just a commentary on the case, even from the senior doctors to have the opinion, because the case is uh, is very nice case. Very good. So, okay. so any one of the guests or attendees want to uh, participate, please raise your hand, please. No one, no one wants to interact with. It's an easy yes, Doctor Said Khamis. Doctor Said Khamis. Yes. I think I think basically or initially we should hold the vitamin D and the, the calcium. That's from my opinion. Hold the vitamin D and calcium. Okay. Yeah. On assumption that um, she had low turnover bone disease. Yeah. Okay. It's I, I think it's uh, rational thinking. Thank you, boss. Yeah, welcome, sir. Who else do we have? Dr. Hani Mansour. Hani. Yes, yes, I think we'll, we'll try to use also low calcium dialysate. We'll try to minimize any extra unneeded calcium to be given to her. Very good. So you're on the same side with Dr. Saeed Hamis that this patient has low turnover from disease. So you would uh, just try to limit the calcium intake vitamin D uh, intake and yes and, uh, when, uh, and I think also the, the most important thing to monitor the BTH the trend of the BTH is very important very good okay who else uh, wants to interact with Dr. Uh, Zayan Dr. Dr. Zayan please uh, your uh, choice uh, I, I chose actually, I, I must check the markers of bone formation and bone resorption, uh, the bone specific alkaline phosphatase and the trap B, uh, 5B. Where you do that, Dr. Tara, very good thinking. What do you want to do that? Uh, actually, to assess, uh, to see if the patient uh, going to the direction of low turn, low uh, bone turnover disease or not, through the marker of bone formation and bone resorptions before to decide if I'm going to biopsy or not. So if I, if I found the patient, his alkaline phosphatase, as, as we see, it is in the normal range. That means the bone formation is a subtle effect. Uh, regarding the trap B5, uh, I, I, I think that we must also see also the level of uh, osteoclastic activity through it to decide uh, if there is also a stopping of the resorption of the bone or not. Very good, very good. 
so why uh, do you think you want to do this if the BTH is very low? If the BTH is very low like that, 2.5 or so, the level was repeated, it's from ranging from 2.5 to 54. Why do you still think that this patient might not have lower over bondage? Because everybody else, uh, I, I think, agreed that this patient has low turnover bone disease and wants to proceed with its management. Why do you think differently? And anyone, anyone who wants to, to, to add to the interaction? Yeah. Uh, okay, can, can you hear me, Dr. Hussain? Uh, yes, I hear you will. Okay, so I think. Yes, it is most probably it is low turnover bone disease, and we are, if if I am sure that uh, she had low turnover bone disease, so I may stop vitamin D and calcium and see. But if the patient had severe osteoporosis, she may get benefit from uh, maybe terabarotide. If, if okay, the patient can't, so can't are, care of, yes, if, if, I, if I follow Saeed the patient, Khamis. yes, Saeed Khamis. Dr. Saeed. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, so it seems everybody doctor is in with Dr. Saeed Hamis' uh, side, except Tarek Zayad. He wants to do other tests because he is not certain. I don't know what he is, um, you know, um, trying to find, but I think what he wants to say that this patient might not have low turnover bone disease, if I am right. Okay. So let us proceed with, with this case. Uh, next slide, please. The only tricky part of this case is the alkaline phosphatase. The total alkaline phosphatase was inconsistent with low turnover bone disease. Usually in low turnover bone disease, the total alkaline phosphatase will be on the lower side. Again, you remember I discussed that with Dr. Magda Sharkari and he was convinced that we can use that instead of the bone-specific alkaline phosphatase. Yes, you can. Not at the same certainty if you use the bone-specific. But you remember, alkaline phosphatase comes mainly from three sources. Either the bone, the majority comes out from the bone, but also it comes out from the placenta and it comes out from the liver. So if you have you know, cholestasis, or if you have obstruction somewhere in your liver, uh, in the biliary uh, system, you would have higher total alkaline phosphatase. If you have a pregnant woman, which is very unlikely on dialysis, or if you have cor corio, you know, uh, uh, cancer, that you will have, you know, a very large amount of, uh, you know, high serum alkaline phosphatase. But if you, you rule out this rare circumstances, yes, alkaline phosphatase at least can give you a rough idea about the bone turnover. So higher alkaline phosphatase doesn't match with the low turnover bone disease. So that's a tricky, yes, the BTH is in the lower side, but does BTH give you everything? You know, I don't think it does, and we'll discuss that. And we have to be careful when we deal with the BTH number because there is different assays and, you know, several assays can have some interference and interactions with some other biochemical uh, materials. This patient was taking biotin. Biotin interact with the BTH assay by the Alexis method. So if you are analyzing what we have done, is or, or you know the nephrologist has done not me he sent the same blood sample to different labs and he found that when he did it with a different uh, assay using semen emulite 2000 assay the level was 786 and at the same time he went he sent the same blood sample to the other uh, lab that had lower level and, and he checked that these, uh, you know, labs, they are using different technique using Roche, Alexis 2010 immunoassay. He found that this assay can interact with the BTH. 
Next, please. You know that biotin is very common. You know, most of our patients are using multivitamins. And one of these multivitamins is the biotin, which is vitamin B7. You know, vitamin B1 is thiamine, two is riboflavin, six is virodexine, seven is biotin, nine is folate, and 12 is, uh, you know, the uh, vitamin uh, B12 so, so. that can induce the pernicious anemia or megaloplastic anemia. Anyway, so B7 is biotin. And this biotin, patients who are taking high uh, amount uh, uh, of uh, um, vitamin B7 or the biotin, this can interfere with the, of the BTH assay by using Alexis method. Next, please. So this is not my case. This case actually was published in uh, this uh, uh, journal, the Chemical Chemistry Journal, and discussed the, the details of the biotin interference with the BH assay using different uh, BTH uh, method, especially if you use the Alexis method. Next. So you would, it's better to know exactly what assay you are using and what interaction you can have. Here, you can get 100% reduction of your BTH level if you are using a high dose of biotin. Next. So biotin interfere with BTH assay using the Alexis platform. Samples from patients receiving high biotin doses, especially if patient is receiving more than five milligrams per day, the sample should be collected at least eight hours after biotin administration. So, next please. So, the high and low turnover bone disease sometimes is tricky. If you depend only on one number, especially if you only depend on the BTH, you can still uh, miss some patient and mistreat this patient for high or low turnover bone disease while the patient has the different spectrum. So it's very important. If you see, especially the tricky part of, of this patient is the alkaline phosphatase doesn't align with the very low BTH level. Next, please. As you know, and we have been discussed before, there is a spectrum of um, you know, renal dystrophy pathology that we can see. And this spectrum is from very low uh, turnover bone disease and the adynamic bone disease, osteomalacia, and up to the other spectrum is very high turnover bone disease with ostitis fibrosa, cystica, and um, the both spectrum very low or very high turnover bone disease is associated with increased uh, fracture risk and increased cardiovascular calcification and mortality. Next, please. So why BTH level goes up? Let's talk a little bit about BTH uh, levels and what happened in our uh, patients with CKD and dialysis patients. Next. So BTH starts first as adaptive. So the hyperparathyroidism that we see in our patients early on is just an adaptive mechanism. This adaptive mechanism protects against uh, the low turnover bone disease. As you can see, the uh, spectrum of the bone disease that happen in early in CKD stage two, uh, three, and four is uh, there is um, you know higher possibility and higher prevalence of low turnover bone disease. Then the BTH goes up usually not before stage three B with a GFR of less than forty five as an adaptive mechanism to stimulate the bone formation and avoid having low turnover bone disease. Another thing is also the BTH can be retained, especially in severe with severe degree of renal dysfunction and in dialysis patients. So to have the same amount of biologically active BTH, you should have much higher serum concentration because the majority or a big part of the BTH is biologically inactive. Next, please. So it's important to know what happened with the BTH and with the different assay. And 
you know, the BTH that we are checking uh, or assaying for our patient is called IBTH. But there is different forms of BTH we should be aware of because this can make misleading diagnosis and the challenge in diagnosis and the management of our cases. Next. Uh, so BTH is an AT4 amino acid. It has two terminals. One is the N terminal and one is a C terminal. So the biologically active amino acids in the BTH, you know, stays in the first four, you know, three, four, or five amino acids in the N terminals. Most of the T C terminal, which is the you know the BTH seven to eighty four, uh, is biologically inactive. And actually, some studies, especially experimental studies, showed that the this fragment, the C fragment, can have anti-calcemic effect. So it antagonizes the BTH, the bioactive or bioavailable BTH. So next, please. The BTH assay, we, whatever we are assaying in the blood, might be different from whatever our patient have. We started checking the uh, our BTH back more than 50 years ago, but till now, so this uh, uh, scientist, um, Dr. Berson or Sir Berson, he discovered a polyclonal antibody against the carboxy terminal. You remember carboxy terminal is not biologically active. Uh, BTH particle. He discovered that um, more than 55 years ago, almost 57 years ago. And as you can see here in the diagram, that this is a single polyclonal, so not a specific antibody, not mon monoclonal. Again, it's mainly the C terminal, which is non specific. So again, you know, polyclonal and not to the end terminal. But again, this was very important because this is the first time we know that this parathyroid gland has important role in our renal osteodystrophy because before that we cannot measure the BTH. So he opened the door of the BTH assay. Next. However, for the last 50 years, we still are struggling with the BTH assay. You can see here, there is different uh, BTH assay evaluated over time from radioimmune assay that, uh, you know, person did with the polyclonal antibody against the C-terminal, then uh, the assay, the radioimmune assay moved to the mid portion of the C-terminal in 1970s, then to the uh, N, uh, you know, terminal, this was 1980s. Then starting from 1990s, about 25 to 30 years ago, we shifted from the one antibody to whatever we call sandwich or two antibody technique, it's immune metric assay, it's second generation assay. So there is one antibody against the C terminal and one antibody against the N terminal. So this is uh, very important because uh, now we can capture this whole uh, you know, um, antibody by using two, um, one against the N terminal and one against the C terminal. Then the most recent, uh, the third generation immune metric assay that was uh, discovered early uh, 2000, now they moved this antibodies to the first amino acid in the N terminal. So now we can detect the BTH with more specific ways using two antibodies, one directed to the first amino acids of the N terminal and one to the C terminal. Next, please. So now what we are doing is we are checking the N terminal. Uh, so we are, sorry, we are checking the IBTH. And IBTH, when you uh, send your patient to get blood test to check the intact BTH, actually this intact BTH, this is a misnorm. So 
when you analyze the BTH, you can have the 184, we call it the whole BTH molecule. You can have truncated 784 BTH, which is lacking the biological activity of the BTH, the calcemic effect. Or you can have only the C-terminal, which is 37 to 84, or very few if you have any of the 5384, which is truncated C-terminal, uh, or the 134 with very, very few fractions, which is biologically active. So intact the BTH, you can have all of these combinations, one, two, or three, or all of them, together with different percentage. Next. Then, here, if you have two CKD patients with the same BTH level, say a thousand, very high level, you can either have the whole BTH, which is a bio, biologically active BTH 50 50 with the BTH 784, which is uh, lacking the biological activity. So, this means that this patient will have about 500 uh, picogram per ml of the 184, which is biologically active, it's a very good amount. But at the same time, another patient with a same level of 1,000 might have 800 of the IBTH 184, which is biologically active, that can increase bone turnover and induce high turnover bone disease. Or at the same time, other patients can have very few amount of the biologically active and the majority are retained the 784 BTH, which is biologically inactive. So you don't know exactly what's going on if you do the IBTH, especially in dialysis patient because the C terminal is retained. Next. Uh, then different assay also can give you different numbers. So even with the same blood sample, if you send it to diasorin, we use diasorin in our lab for the BTH, it'll give you a smaller uh, amount. And if you use Siemens Immulite, the 2000, it can give you three to four folds higher there's, you know, value. So you have to be careful which uh, lab you are using. We, next, Dr. Amr. Dr. Amr. Yes, yes, you, sorry. You, you, are, you are unmuted <laughs> yourself, yes. Go ahead, please. So we published this uh, last year, uh, how to assay and how to understand, this just diagram to help you how to understand the BTH assay. BTH is a complex. It's not like automated, like creatinine and blood sugar and this kind of automated assays. BTH is not standardized, and you should or would know at least some basis about the BTH and different assay and how can, how can this change your management and can impact uh, the result of the BTH uh, you know, number. So first generation, if you are using a first generation that's, you know, you are too old, you are too behind, so hopefully no one is using the first generation, it's not specific. If you are using second generation, that's okay, but you have to understand that you need to use the same lab and you know, you should know what uh, assay you are using because a different assay gives you different number. Third generation is the best, it has two antibodies. One is capturing antibody, one is detecting antibody and the detecting antibody is directed to the first to four amino acids, which are biologically active. Next, please. So each one of these assays has uh, up and down, rows and cones, and so it's important to know uh, each one, rows and cones. The first one, it's very non-specific, the first generation, don't use it. The second one is the most widely used, especially I know in the Middle Eastern area, it's less expensive. And this was the one that was adopted by our current Kitiko and Kidoki guideline because these guidelines were based on the studies that 
uh, used the second generation VTH uh, assay um, about five to 10, maybe 20 years ago. Again, it cross react with the seed um, terminal and there is a wide range of intermittent variables. Then the third generation is directed mainly against the biologically active BTH. It doesn't cross-react with the CB, you know, CD terminal, and it may correlate better with mortality. However, it's more expensive, it's less widely used, and it hasn't been adopted by the new TDGO guidelines at least yet. Then you can use, we, we use here in our lab, uh, both you know, the second and third generation, and we use something, a ratio called VTH 184, which is the whole VTH over the C terminal, which is a 784, and we use it, it's called cap cap ratio, and it's, uh, it correlates better with the bone histomorphometric machine. I think well, that's enough for uh, BTH, then we can take questions about that later on. It's up to you, Dr. Hussein, if you want to discuss this issue or the BTH now, or if you want to keep the question till the end of the lecture, then we can go ahead and pick the uh, piece two. I, I prefer to have five minutes to just for, for a commentary from the, from the seniors, just to give you some ease, okay? Absolutely. Okay, so if anyone, uh, Dr. Saeed Khamis, Dr. Saeed. Uh, uh, Pram, uh, oh. Regarding the BTH assay, uh, actually, as you know, that there is a seasonal variation from uh, summer to winter, even circadian rhythm along the, uh, over the day. Uh, my question is, what are the pre-analytical uh, causes can affect the BTH assay, like transportation, delay in uh, delivery of the sample, uh, the last meal of the food uh, taken by the patient? Is it the midweek session or not? I mean, in paralysis patient. I mean, these factors, how can affect the BTH assay? Thank you. Right, very good question. Thank you, Dr. Sai. It's smart the well, question, thank you. as usual. Thank you. Want you. Me to answer? Okay, so, right. The thing is, we should have consistency. The, 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 the point here, you should be consistent. Using the same lab, same time, because you, as you said, yes, there is circadian. However, the circadian variation is not huge, you know, maybe about 10% or less. Yeah. And this is the reason that we have wide range, 229. This is the widest range ever. You cannot say, I will, you know, the normal serum creatinine is 229, whatever. You know, it's very big variation. When it comes to BTH, because BTH of 300 might not be very different from 400 because of the technical problem and you know the assay uh, challenges that we have. It might not be very different from 500, but most importantly is the trend. Are you you know using the same technique for the same patient, same time, and you see you know the BTH is going up? And you, again, you don't take only one measure. It's serial measurement, and you don't take only one assay. So BTH is one, it's not everything. You look to other things, right? You look to at least the alkaline phosphatase, the total alkaline phosphatase. You look also to other biomarkers of bone formation and bone resorption if you are concerned about your patient. So you know your patient better than anybody else. So you should understand that there is, the BTH is not standardized. There is several, several things that interact. Dif different labs use different assays, and this can give you three to fold, you know, uh, uh, higher or lower um, BTH numbers. So you have to be consistent. You have to look to the trend, and you don't depend only on the BTH. BTH assay has a lot of, it's not a serum creatinine, it's not, you know, a serum calcium. The, the test hasn't been standardized yet. But it, it seems that Professor Saeed Hamis is extremely updated because there, there is a very hot issue, hot article in the current opinion of nephrogen and hypertension uh, discussing the issue of uh, circadian variation and using right. the biological hours for management in the future. So I think Professor Saeed is... Uh, Yes. Right. 
Yes. These are all was updated. Yeah. updated. You see that? <laughs> you, you see that if you change your vision from first uh, shift to second or third shift, you yeah. see that's very very clear. And in your dialysis unit, just to compare, if you do BTH to your dialysis, and hopefully you do, you can compare first shift numbers to second shift number. You can see differences, right? There is circadian rays, morning samples. You know the high. They have higher BTH numbers than you know afternoon or late evening numbers. Okay, thank you, sir. BTH is different according to uh, the gender, according to the age, and more importantly, according to the race. So, uh, I just want to highlight something here because most of the KDGO guidelines, KDOKI guidelines, I don't think, and you know, you just tell me if I'm wrong if they standardize these numbers uh, to our Middle Eastern uh, countries, you know, or Arab countries. They, I don't think they involved our patients in, in these studies. So studies, when they, uh, you know, get this recommendation or guidelines, they based these guidelines mainly on studies that came in either from USA or Europe or to, you know, from Australia or something. So this, you know, the, the, the race is a major player here. African-American, for example, you know, blacks have much higher BTH compared to Caucasian. At any, you know, given level of BTH, the, uh, you know, the African-American people, they will have lower turnover uh, compared to Caucasian. So we also have to, you know, take this into consideration Whatever is working for white or Caucasian American might not be working for Egyptian or Saudi uh, Arabian region. And I yeah. think there is a very nice article, Dr. Amr, uh, comparing the CKD MBD profile, calcium, phosphorus, BTH, among the different countries, Europe, United States, Japan, and other countries. And what there is about a big Arab, variation. What about Arab, Arab yeah, countries? Or completely deficient, completely deficient right. in Arab this and Africa. Yes. We need, right. If we take one thing from this pandemic, you know, this COVID-19 pandemic, we need to depend on ourselves. You cannot yes. depend on others. You have to create your own things. So yeah. even for the key legal guidelines, every country, it takes it and it can just adopt it with some modification and try to come up with its own recommendation based on, should be, based on studies, based on you know, local experience and publication, but uh, hopefully we can have this, you know, standardized in the future. 100% agreement, Professor Amr, about this point. Uh, I think we can move to the next case and to postpone com other comments to the, uh, at the end. Okay. So this second case. Dr. Amr. Trump. Yes, Dr. Hussein. Yes, go ahead, please. I, I will mute it. Okay, so let us discuss the second case. So this case actually was um, presented to me and we discussed it uh, several months ago was Dr. Hussein and his team in uh, Mansoura Urology Necrology Center. But I thought this is a very important and uh, hot topic that we might need to discuss again, because this was only discussed in a small group and it hasn't been modulated or recorded. So I thought it might be better just to discuss it here in this room. So this is a young female, 20 year old, who had in the stage kidney disease and was on dialysis since uh, December 20. 9, 2012, and her original kidney disease was unknown. Again, this uh, is a patient uh, who was referred for renal transplantation to the urology and nephrology center at Mansoura University. And here is her lab. The serum, uh, corrected serum calcium was 9.7, phosphorus was 5.5, alkaline phosphatase was super high 
and PTH was extremely high. Next, please. So the team, the transplant team, did some uh, image and they found that this patient has right femoral greater to counter cyst and she was limping. So this patient, they diagnosed this patient have severe hyter, you know, hyter overbone disease. She has osteitis fibrosa cystica. Probably she has brown tumors. So osteoplastoma, you know, there is a growing of the flat bone and long bone, and the bone is replaced by big cysts. So um, they sent the patient for beratoridectomy because of the, uh, you know, severe uh, refractory hyperbarathyroidism. This patient had beratoridectomy February 2013. Then, post of she had a corrected calcium level of six. So, her calcium level went down, uh, serum phosphorus level 6.5, and the PTH went down to 45. Next. Okay. So, this patient, they said it's okay, she was treated for the refractory uh, hyperpara. Then they did a uh, right iliac renal allotransplant April 2013 from her mother with 50% uh, 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 percent matching. She uh, was induced by bezofleximab and she was maintained on uh, TACRO and MMF without steroids. Here is her after at day one after transplantation, her urine output is seven liters and her creatinine was very optimal, 0.6 milligram. Hemoglobin is good. Corrected calcium level is 5.9 and the BTH is one. Next. Follow up, she had very good kidney transplant function well, but her problem is after transplantation, she had persistent hypocalcemia and recurrent admission with seizures and uh, she was on anti-seizure medicine with a lot of calcium and vitamin D intake just to try to maintain the highest uh, calcium level possible, but she was you know, on the lower calcium side. And despite of having low calcium, her BTH persistently was low, less than 10. Two years later, she came in, presented uh, to Mansoura Urology Center with severe headache, biliary vision, and her examination, the blood pressure was okay. She doesn't have any neurological deficit and they did barometry, she didn't have any visual field defect. They did a lot of image, including MRI, MRV, so the stenography that was negative. Then they did uh, ophthalmoscopy by uh, one of the eye doctors. And as you see here, this young lady who had a transplant was very well-functioning graft she had bilateral papilledema. Next. So they did a lumbar puncture that was negative, uh, but the pressure, the manometry was, she has very high pressure. So having very high, you know, lumbar uh, puncture pressure without having any, uh, you know, Describe reason for increased intracranial tension. This is called idiopathic intracranial hypertension or pseudotumor cerebral. Next. This is the last follow up lab. Calcium still on the lower side. Phosphorus 3.5, BTH 1.9. Next. So, this is an interesting case. What do you want to do next for this patient with persistent hypocalcemia after 
you know, kidney transplantation and baroseridectomy. And Dr. Hussein, if you would like to unmute uh, some. Dr. Yasser al Mullah, Dr. Yasser, uh, Yasser Mullah, Edinburgh Hospital, UK. Dr. Yasser. Please unmute yourself, Dr. Yasser. Okay. If anyone want, wants to interact, please. If we have a Professor Riyad Saeed, uh, I'm not sure if it's iPhone or iPhone doctor. iPhone. Dr. Saeed Khamis, so, oh, yes. I, I think the problem uh, there is an association between the hypopara and the hypocalcemia with this uh, pseudo tumor survive. Although it is infrequent, but it is there, I think, from the literature. Very good. Thank you, sir. So, hypopara, yeah. hypocalcemia yeah. Uh, was one of the reasons that this patient, especially, she was not getting steroid. You know, steroid is very well known reason yeah. for the tumor survive, but this patient was fortunate enough to be on a steroid-free regimen. So I agree with, uh, with uh, Professor Saeed Hamis that the hypocalcemia and the hypobara is an inducing uh, factor here for the pseudotumor cerebri. Yeah. Next. Very good. Thank you, sir. Next, uh, Dr. Hussein. Welcome, Dr. Hussein, please. Yes, uh, I enjoyed very much uh, the cases. You know, we did. I did myself. I was the leader of one big study, of what is known as infamous to protect the and hold the Middle East. And we found that the doctors they are aware about the problem of hyperpara, uh, but they are not uh, going with the recommendations to check the phosphorus and alkaline phosphatase and BTH. So. Still, we are lacking in this area, and I hope that uh, by this talk, the people will start to, to know even the non-traditional war for management, which I, myself, I understand a lot today uh, about uh, the things which is non-medication, which I can use it in, in order to uh, to control all uh, the abnormalities which the CKD patients have. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Professor thank you very much. Dr. Hani Mansour. Yes, uh, I think we can uh, try tari baritide here, especially in hypocalcemia, because uh, it may be suppressing the increased CSF production. Very good. Hani, I, I have a question for you. Yes. So the consequences uh, of events for this uh, young uh, lady that her BTH was very high before the baratheridectomy, then her calcium and BTH dropped severely, you know, dropped right after the surgery. Then her calcium and BTH little bit improved, uh, you know, a month or so after the surgery. Then after she got the transplant, both went again very low. Why do you think this events happened? Uh, initially, the hypocalcemia post-surgery uh, may be related to hungry bone syndrome and the, the, the story, this story. Uh, but later, persistent uh, hypobara is uh, uh, is unexplained here with uh, uh, after transplant. Maybe she has, she has some contributing factor. Okay, I agree with the first part, but uh, there should be a clear reason why this patient after transplant she dropped her calcium more and her BTH more. 
Any anybody else wants to uh, you know discuss or explain why the problem with the hypocalcemia and probably also hypophosphatemia and hypobara happened after transplantation. And you remember, if you attended the last session, we discussed the calcium homeostasis and what happened in dialysis patient because we discussed that our dialysis patients, they are usually on a positive calcium balance because they cannot get rid of the excess calcium they are getting because the, their urine output is minimum. So you usually excrete your excess calcium that you absorb in the gut in your urine, right? And if you are taking more calcium, your gut will inhibit the calcium absorption, but also your kidney will get rid of the excess calcium. This is not the case for our dialysis patient. Moreover, our dialysis patient, we can give them higher calcium path during dialysis that improve their hypocalcemia, right? So once this patient is off dialysis, making seven liters of urine a day, so excreting more calcium in her urine, at the same time you don't balance this with giving her high calcium during dialysis, then she dropped down more her calcium. The BTH, while on dialysis, if even she had few amount of parathyroid gland left and you know few numbers of parathyroid cells with the dialysis, it can stimulate these cells to secrete some. Of course, the BTH was low, but it was extremely low after she get the transplant because she lost the stimulus that the secondary or tertiary hyperpara people have, so both. So uh, now we are facing this major problem. I agree with Hani that early on after the surgery, our baritaridectomy patient, they drop down their calcium, but this happened mainly because of the hungry bone syndrome, that's number one. So the calcium is just you know, taken by the bone because it hasn't seen calcium for a long time. It needs calcium, right? So the calcium was getting out from the bone because of the hydrogen overbone disease that hyperbara induced. And now the BTH, the stimulus is gone. So now there is no demineralization. There is no uh, calcium efflux from the bone and instead the bone takes most of the calcium. So this drop down the calcium. This is a transient effect. Then after this, the patient was, you know, little bit better by having dialysis with high calcium, getting another thing that I didn't discuss. This patient probably is getting calcium based phosphate binders and whatever, you know, um, some vitamin D and some calcium on dialysis. And all of this are gone after transplantation. So all the severity of hypoparathyroidism and hypocalcemia was more evident after transplantation. Again, if the patient is having better kidney function as well, and increase the magnitude of the problem. So you have to be careful with dealing with these patients. If you are transplanting a patient with Hypobara, patient with history of parathyroidectomy, you have to be more careful and you have to predict what can happen in the future and try to uh, prevent this from happening. Dr. Excuse me, Dr. Am. Dr. Zayan, do you have any question? Yeah, please, uh, Dr. Amr, uh, can we, in these types of cases, just to control uh, the secretion of uh, calcium? to aside to the drugs that the patient uh, take. So maybe it is just decrease uh, calcium excretion from the kidney. So it maybe improve uh, to somewhat the level of calcium. After transplantation? Yeah. Right, you can do that. However, the main contributing factor to reserve your calcium in the urine is the BTS. Okay, so that diuretic would help, but again, um, 
with the severe hypocalcemia and severe hypobara, it wouldn't be very helpful. My message is, yes, I agree with you. You can try that, but uh, I don't know how much you can improve the serum calcium level uh, by using thiazide diuretics. But it's, it's, it's a smart, uh, you know, idea. However, Said, I like... Said Khamis uh, raised his hand, Dr. Said. I'm regarding the, she was not hypo, hypercalcemic before this operation. She was not hypercalcemic before. No, she wasn't. She wasn't. Uh, so I was thinking of this uh, nephrogenic DI from hypercalcemia and so on. But anyway, uh, is there is any uh, what's called uh, uh, role for this the steroid post transplant regarding the calcioric effect of the steroid? In this she, she was a steroid, steroid free, Dr. Said. Ah, oh, she's steroid free. Oh, sorry, yes. I didn't uh, pay attention. To okay. Her. Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. Yes. So, I think the take home message from this, and the reason that I'm discussing this case, because I'm seeing a trend to do more baratheridectomy in Egypt, and in the, even when I did some work at Saudi Arabia uh, years ago, I still see that. Here, actually, uh, in America, uh, the need for baratheridectomy is going down. And when I visit Egypt, I see a lot of physicians, especially surgeons, and the physician from programs uh, that do more baratheridectomy, they are very proud of doing baratheridectomy. My message is, is you shouldn't be proud. You shouldn't, it's, a, it's, it's a guilty, it's a shameful situation. This means that either you or the patients are doing something wrong. Either the, it's, it's a failure of, so you don't do baratheridectomy except if you fail the medical treatment. Maybe it's because of the patient reason, you know, non-compliance or blah, 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 or too late to control it like this piece, but also might be that we don't use uh, the proper medication early. The problem, as you know, that there is an early on, there is polyclonal proliferation of the gland with glandular hyperplasia. But if the stimulus goes on for a long time, this polyclonal proliferation, it changes to monoclonal proliferation. And the calcium sensing receptors and the vitamin D receptors is downregulated. So even you cannot control the severe degree of hyperpara by medication because you are either working on the vitamin D receptors or the calcium sensing receptors to control the hyperbara and both are down, re down regulated. So it's, you have, we, we need to do a better job. We need to convince our patients to take their medicines. That's, and if we need to do baratheridectomy, and I didn't say that there is uh, no reason or no indication. Yes, there is indication, but this indication should be limited especially with the new uh, medications and innovation in this field, the need for baratheridectomy should uh, go down and the trend should go down. The other take home message from this is we have to discuss with the surgeon not to be very aggressive. This is not a cancer. They don't have to take that tumor with um, you know, a safety margin. If they are very aggressive like this case, and they take most of the parathyroid tissue, especially if this patient is getting a transplant in the, in the future, probably they are inducing harm more than benefit. So the harm of hyperbara is that the high turnover bone disease, but also they put the patient on hyperbara and low turnover bone disease, not only that, but also they can induce severe hypocalcemia with its consequences like this patient with seizure, bone disease. Definitely this patient has severe bone disease prior to baratheridectomy, but I am very sure that this patient also has severe bone disease with a different spectrum on the opposite side of the spectrum with low turnover bone disease after having this extensive baratheridectomy. So the take home, the other take home message would be very aggressive. Discuss with your surgeon that they don't have to lower down the BTH from 2000 to 20 or 30 or 40 or two digits. At least keep three digits. Keep the BTH according to the KDGO or KDUKI guidelines, 150 to 300 or 
you know, 150 to 600, according to the Kitigo guidelines. Don't kill all the parathyroid gland. Parathyroid gland is one of the most pivotal glands and organs we have in our body. It's our friend, not our enemy. Sometimes, yes, there is change from adaptive to maladaptive uh, hyperparathyroidism, but again, we just need to get it to the right direction, not to kill it. Don't kill your friend. You might need it in the future. So try to be gentle. Even if paratheidically is indicated, talk to your surgeon, explain to them this is not a primary hyperbara or a cancer that you need to take the whole thing. They have to keep sufficient amount of tissue. And we started this. There is no time to discuss this today, but we published several studies in this field and we proved that most of our patients after paratheidectomy, they end up by having severe hypobara uh, and lotus liver bone disease. And this also can induce, increase the cardiovascular calcification because the bone cannot utilize any calcium. And the calcium also stays in the extra, uh, you know, skeleton and it goes to the cardiovascular system and cause calcification. I think I will stop by here. Of course, Hani said teriparatide. I yeah, completely agree. You can try it. However, you should know that teriparatide is not a replacement. There is no hormone replacement therapy for hypoparathyroidism. It just increases the bone formation, so it stimulates the bone. And by the way, teriparatide can cause hypocalcemia because it will help the bone to build up more you know, and will need more calcium and phosphorus and minerals to build up bone. So it might actually exacerbate the problem of hypocalcemia. It's good, it uh, improves bone formation rates, so hopefully it will be good to um, limit the problem of low turnover bone disease. However, it's not hormonal replacement therapy. It's not, you cannot give it as, you know, lifelong therapy. If you want to give it for six months or a year, that's fine. You shouldn't give it for more than two years, but it doesn't alleviate the whole problem, but at least it can stimulate the bone formation and uh, just uh, decrease the problem of uh, severe hypobarathyroid bone disease and low over bone disease, but it doesn't usually alleviate the problem of hypocalcemia. And we used it, uh, Dr. Amr, for a build of time for this case. And regarding the use of teriparatide, even uh, there is a case series about the use of teriparatide to treat hypercalcemia. So uh, as you mentioned, it may lead to hypocalcemia exactly. if, they, if the cause is right. a dynamic bone disease and we can expect here a dynamic bone disease. So it may worsen the situation. And we give it for right. a period of time with no benefit. Yeah, so the take home message, this is not the solution. Yeah, it might help, it might mm -hmm. not but it's not hormonal replacement therapy. So we cannot depend on this and say, okay, if even uh, we induce hypopara, we can treat it with teriparatide. This is uh, not the right thing to do. It can help, right? But it's not replacing the therapy. Very good. I, I think I will stop by here. And if you want to seem to open the banner for and the even And even we think of parathyroid transplantation, but for uh, some uh, psychological issues, we... Uh, decided, Good luck for that. No, uh, we, we decide not to proceed for this point. I, I know, I know you uh, tried this in, in your uh, center. We have tried this also, and several people have tried, and I don't think we can depend on that because the success of saving or preserving these parathyroid cells for a long time is it's not very successful. Uh, I think the key message, as you mentioned, Professor Amr, is to speak to the surgeon, to be gentle as he can. And one point you mentioned at uh, your uh, center that you measured the, the PTH during surgery. Just a few right. what this point is. Yes. Exactly. It's another thing you can ask. And usually here it's a standard of care for surgeon to do that. It's called the Turbo BTS. They can get instant, uh, you know, level, BTH level within 10 minutes. So they can take and wait the parathyroid gland they remove. They usually take at least 60 or 70%. Then they check the level. 
uh, again, they usually want to go, um, you know, the BTH, turbo BTH, uh, lower than 80% or 90% of the baseline. But we discussed that with them. You, they don't have to be very aggressive. They don't have even to go to percentage. You just need to keep it around 150 to 300, which should be fine. And I think this is one of the uh, very nice uh, key messages that uh, we have from you, Professor Amr, through discussions about the cases. We shouldn't be very happy by bit H0 <laughs> because it will, very, it will be very bad associated with many con bad consequences. But nowadays we learn it enough uh, to discuss with right. the surgeon to be just gentle. And, just and gentle. This, is, this is not the end of the story. So taking yes. out the, the gland is, is not a solution. Probably might be it's a starting, you're starting the problem. Mm. Even if we continue after baratheridectomy uh, with uh, calcium mimetics, with vitamin D, whatever, it, it will be fine if we, if, we, if we adjust the lab and treat the patient accordingly. Uh, and this will be because we have arms of management. And if the BTH is zero, we have nothing to do with this patient. Right. Yeah, right. So, yeah, that's a very important uh, point that Dr. Hussein mentioned that. As, we, as nephrologists, we know how to treat hyperbara, but we are not very familiar how to treat hypobara. You know, any you know, junior nephrologist knows how to treat the, the high beta edge and bring it down with vitamin D and alloys and calcium mimetics. But when it comes to treat the hypobara, I think we are very behind and we don't have some, you know, very good experience to deal with that. Is there any new update about rumuzumab uh, in, uh, in dynamic in bone disease? In dynamic bone disease, to my mind or to my knowledge, and I'm not very updated. Maybe maybe a couple months that uh, <laughs> oh, you cannot use it in dialysis patients. Okay, okay, Professor uh, Faisal. Again, lower kidney function. This patient might have increased cardiovascular calcification anyway. Again, but, also you know. Um, biologically, you are not, you are just increasing the bone formation. And again, this can also induce hypocalcemia, but it might be helpful to treat the severe low turnover bone disease just by stimulating the osteoblast for more bone formation, but it's not going to resolve the problem. And the major aspect is increased cardiovascular, the concern of increased cardiovascular calcification and mortality. And uh, I think the talk today, uh, although the, the PowerPoint was not helpful, but it, is, it was very fantastic. It is fantastic because it settled. Sorry, the, yeah, I'm very the, sorry for the technical no, no, it, no, no, you shouldn't be sorry. Uh, it is very interesting, very exciting. And I think the, as Professor Faisal Shaheen mentioned, uh, to include uh, non-pharmacological treatment uh, to our armamentarium of management, we shouldn't forget the natural management. But if we have severe hyperbara, it is mandatory to use drugs, and uh, if drug fail, we'll do surgery. So we shouldn't be shameful if the patient needs surgery, but to tell the surgeon to uh, be uh, gentle. I think and we shouldn't be very proud either. Uh, yes. Uh, Dr. Faisal, Professor Faisal Shane, and then we'll uh, take some questions from the chat. Yes, regarding parasyridectomy, you know, we pass through phases uh, mm -hmm. before maybe 20 years. Yes. Doing a lot of our patients, we send them for parasyridectomy and the implant to take one of the probes and implant it in the hand. And then we came to the era where we don't have more, not too much patients going for parasyridectomy. And mainly, we were using a tool of calcium mimetic. Maybe it was drug influence that we have to use these tools in order to suppress uh, the parathyroid and we keep the parathyroidectomy in a very rare cases. But nowadays, it returned back again. So we have many patients now we need to do parathyroidectomy for them. And as we mentioned, I am very happy to hear that we should be a little bit calm and uh, not to take all the things out maybe we can leave one loop or again implant it in somewhere else because we we still need it we still need the parasite thank right. you for this excellent excellent combination
Yeah, Oturan. That's very, very smart comment. Yeah, again, I don't know what's going on. Why do we, uh, are we seeing, as, again, as I'm not very objective here, I'm just talking about my experience talking to the nephrologists in Egypt and then the Middle Eastern you know, countries with Saudi Arabia as well. I see also that there might be a trend that's just uh, as very subjective, not an objective, um, you know, estimation or assessment. So, yeah, I think we uh, just need to talk about it more and not to be very, uh, you know, aggressive or at least uh, bushy toward the baritaridectomy, especially now, ethical side, you know, the IV calcium mimetics, it seems we can bring down the BTH more, you know, efficiently, especially with patient with BTH level more than a thousand or so. And maybe also the lack of transplantation can lead to the patient stay for a long time on dialysis and also they get uh, tertiary hyperbara or secondary hyperbara, very difficult to be treated. So they go more for surgery. So uh, uh, Dr. Fisal is promoting for more transplant than to wait <laughs> on dialysis than have you know, severe interactable secondary or tertiary, but I completely agree with that. Very good. Agree. Thank you, Professor Faisal, for your, for your points. Here, so, there is some uh, points. Uh, Barotheridectomy should uh, be associated with autotransplantation. Dr. Am? Uh, uh, yeah, it's a good question. Most of the study didn't show, so you can do total barotheridectomy with autotransplantation, or you can do subtotal or near total barotheridectomy. Again, most of the studies, they are aggressive anyway. And most of these auto-implanted uh, barothyroid uh, tissue, it doesn't persist or doesn't work for a long time. Um, at the beginning, it might be, so there is two phases here. First is the phase one, after taking the barothyroid gland out and implanting some tissue, this gland can still work for maybe a couple months because, you know, even if you get transplantation, the problem with the secondary or tertiary hyperbia, it stays about six months or up to a year. So this tissue can be, have, it's, it's because it's behind, this gland can still be working, you know, try to replacing the, the uh, other barotheroid gland that was removed. Then after six, month or so, even if not every case you see that, but some patients see that, then you lose this. Are you losing these cells by time because they don't live longer? Or, and they get ischemic and ischemic injury and they die? Or because of you lose the compensation that they have in the beginning? Nobody, I think, answers this question. But the bottom line is, uh, it's, it doesn't work in every single patient, and it's not the resolution. You can do whatever subtotal or total with the auto, but the majority of these cases, we started this, and 90% of cases that had barotheridectomy, they end up by having BTH at two digit uh, levels. So BTH of less than 100, right? And, uh, uh, you know, hypobarotheridism is a major issue here. The take home message is not about doing auto or doing total or subtotal. The take home message is you need to talk to the surgeon, make sure that they are not too aggressive. Tell them about, they are not familiar with the KDO guidelines. You don't know about the BTH that we need to maintain between you know, 150 to 600. They think that you need to bring the BTH for 10 or 20 levels. So they don't understand that they are surgeons. Sorry, uh, uh, hopefully uh, don't have surgeons here. Uh, okay, uh, regarding the um, doing uh, radiological evaluation uh, for localization before surgery. Uh, Mr. Mavis, can, yeah, you can yeah. do that. Is it routine? Is it routine in your center, Dr. Am? Yes, it's a routine, but there is no, it's, it's just routine in my center, sorry. That's yeah. not, there is no consensus, but we find it very helpful because sometimes there is an ectopic tissue especially in the lower part of the neck or upper part of the chest that you need to localize. And, uh, but our surgeons, they do thymectomy and they go to the upper part of the chest and they try to retrieve the parathyroid tissue anyway. But we, we do systematic scan just in case if there is you know, 
any octopic uh, volatile rate tissue embedded anywhere. So they should be aware of, right? So yeah. I think if you can, you know, have it, if you can have the system, maybe scan, you can do it and it's, it's helped, right? It's not mandatory, but I think it's helped. Is there a minimum or maximum dose of vitamin D post total parathyroidectomy? Or we yeah, sh should depend the on mineral level? The, right. Um, the problem is, you know, who uh, ends up by having parathyroidectomy? Usually non-compliant patients, to be honest, right? So don't depend on this patient that if you are giving them, you know, tons of calcium and vitamin D after the parathyroidectomy, they are going to take it. That's number one. Number two, if you don't have parathyroid tissue, so parathyroid tissue maintains the calcium inside your blood in the extra vascular, in the you know, extra space, in the vascular space, right? If you don't have DTH, what will happen to this calcium? You give a lot of vitamin D, and vitamin D increases absorption of calcium in the gut and increases reabsorption of calcium in the urine, you know, after transplantation or exhibition as a general so you can put this patient, even if they have hypocalcemia and because they are, you know, have hypobiotic, so the calcium doesn't go to the bone. The calcium doesn't stay in the blood because the BTH is the main determinant of, you know, normalization of serum calcium level. So where does the calcium go? And as you know, that there is other studies that show that one year after parathyroidectomy, there is increased cardiovascular calcification. And there is induction, 90% of this patient they, you, you know, change the spectrum from high turnover to low turnover. 80% very low turnover. And the degree of bone turnover is associated with the degree of calcium feature. So lower, you know, bone uh, formation rate is associated with higher cardiovascular calcium feature. So again, as the safety of this, as there is a concern, safety concern here. It's not about how much you can. You can give whatever you can, but the problem is, I mean, if the patient is going to take it, and if he takes it, it doesn't stay in the blood because the BTH is low, it doesn't go to the bone, it goes to somewhere else, and this can increase cancer. If the patient has parathyroid nodule, this is one of the questions here, uh, more than one centimeter, how much the surgeon to be gentle? Recurrence with parathyroid nodule is very high. Right, so the nodule is different story. If it is tertiary and nodule, and he can take out the nodule and leave some of the normal or hyperplastic you know, parathyroid cells, that's, that's fine. But the problem is, especially if you don't find nodule, you just take all the tissue that he can see. You know, successful surgery for a surgeon means that there is no failure, no recurrence. So, so for, just I'll give you an example. You have a patient with BTH of 1,000. You fail the medical treatment, send him to the surgeon. The surgeon in his mind, if his BTH stays Four or five hundred, that's failure, right? But if the BTH is 10 or 20, for him, he will be happy. That's success. That's what the, you know, the surgeon mentality is. They are, they want to make sure that there is no recurrence, there is no failure. So no failure for them is success, which is opposite to us. Having a BTH of 10 or 20 is failure by all the prological standards. We have to teach them the success and the failure of this surgery is not about taking the whole, you know, parathyroid cells and leaving the patient without. No, the, you know, how to master the surgery is how to keep sufficient amount of parathyroid tissue because our patients need this parathyroid cells and tissue and if they don't have it, they will have severe, you know, consequences, not be less than the, you know, the problem with hyperparathyroid. So he is inducing harm. The majority of surgeons, they are inducing harm more than them. We have- Is, is there a real, again, okay. Is there a, a real difference between, this is another question. Is there a real difference between one alpha calcidol or calstriol? or the analogs of vitamin D receptor analogs? Yeah, I mean, the problem is with the hyperphosphatemia, which one is, is inducing hyperphosphatemia more, uh, the, the other and hypercalcemia more. The problem is we don't have alpha calcidol here. So mm. the, the usually you don't see, you know, head-to-head -head comparison. In America, we use the calcitriol. In Europe and I think in the Middle East countries, they have alpha calcidol. Uh, Zembla, you know, uh, the, the other thing is uh, vitamin D analog 
uh, doxycarcinol or varicarcinol, uh, it's, it's more effective. I think that's, you know, at least based on the literature review and my experience, especially you can give it in the dialysis unit and IV, uh, and it uh, might be, uh, you know, uh, more uh, efficient with less side effects, especially when it comes to hyperphosphatine. Again, all of this in severe, we are doing on, uh, on different things here because a PTH of 2,000 is very too high, you know, very hard to control it just with alpha calcidol or calciterior or, you know, baricalcidol or doxycalciferol. It's not sufficient. The vitamin D receptor is severely down mutated. So the way that, you know, this medication works, uh, it doesn't work in this kind of patients. Okay, I want to send the patient with pathological fracture with high barbara to the orthopedic surgeon. This is one of the questions, yes. Pathological fracture that need to oh. be fixed? Uh, yes, uh, orthopedic I'm... surgeon as healing of uh, fracture is very slow for this case. Okay, a healing of fracture is slow. There is different reason of, of you know, uh, slower or, uh, you know, a bad healing of a fracture. It might be anatomical thing, it might be related to infection or misdisplacement or, you know, misalignment of, of, of uh, you know, the pieces of the bone. This is a surgical thing. So, yeah, the, the surgeon has to be involved in this. But we as a nephrologist or, you know, we need to know how to treat the bone because if you don't have bone formation, the surgeon depends on, the surgeon bought the two pieces of bone basically together. Depending on the bone formation that will connect to this by callus formation at the beginning, then this callus formation will be calcified and there will be continuity of bone. If the patient has either high turnover or low turnover bone disease, this process doesn't happen. So in high turnover bone disease, there is more bone resorption than bone formation. Bone formation is, is okay, is good, might be high, but because of bone resorption is much, much higher, it doesn't allow, so the balance between bone formation and bone resorption here, you know, this patient have problems. It doesn't allow him to heal. On the other hand, low turnover bone disease, there is no bone formation or very low or very slow. So we need to stimulate bone formation and we need to stop or slow down the bone resorption in these cases to help with the healing of this fracture. Uh, Dr. Tarek uh, wants to chair. Please, Dr. Tarek. Five minutes and we'll stop, Dr. Am. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah. Inshallah, five minutes. Okay. Uh, unmute yourself, Ya Bash. Yes. Uh, I'm with you, of course, okay. about uh, premature uh, parasyridectomy is more hazardous than benefits, of course. But actually, uh, we met cases with severe uh, hyperparasyridism not responding to calcium mimetics, and with cases with parathyroid adenoma, with brown tumor, ugly faces, I think there is no role for medical treatment. And even the issue of subtotal parathyroidectomy without value, because there is failure to come to the standard level of parathyroid hormone, because after subtotal parathyroidectomy were faced with 3,000 or more level of parathyroid uh, hormone. I'm with you, we are not with pre-mature parathyroidectomy, and on the other hand, total parathyroidectomy will be for cases with severe secondary hyperparathyroidism, as mentioned, tertiary parathyroidism, hyperparathyroidism, because of the, a lot of complications we met before with cases with severe parathyroidism up to mortality. We have brown tumors, we have ugly faces, we have severe uh, bony veins, severe anemia on the other uh, side. I am with you uh, uh, to follow the trend of parathyroid with more uh, uh, orientation or, or knowledge about how to manage, this will be uh, very rare to, to, to meet this uh, difficult scenario that we met before in the, in the, in the early of uh, 2000 uh, before. 
I think the, 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 the word of secret of success is to start earlier and yes. depend upon on the full, as Professor Amr taught us, uh, to look at the full pattern of the bone, not only BTH, yeah. and yeah. to start earlier and looking at the trend for all uh, bone profile. Dr. Amr, yeah. what's your opinion about this point? Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I'm not against parathyroidectomy. <laughs> you are the con of brother <laughs> you are not the bro you are the con and you are not the bro it is it, it, we, we hate brother me but sometimes it's a must to be done because of failure right, right. of medical treatment or intolerance because calcium you know calcium mimetic are not innocent drugs associated with gastrointestinal side effects and hypocalcemia uh, so if the patient unfit or i cannot offer him proper dosage of calcium emetic. This is, I think this is an indication for parathyroidectomy, but the message which added a lot to the practice is to be more gentle. Uh, to have uh, beta H5, right. 4, 8, 0, it is, not, uh, any, is, it is not good anymore. We need, we need to initiate dialogues with yes. our parathyroid surgeons. They have to understand us. They have to understand our Kidigo recommendation and our target level of PTH. We have to understand the hypoparathyroid, you know, problem that we don't see. usually see it, the other speckles, the high, you know, turnover, high hyperbara, but they don't see the hypobara. And they left us alone in this problem to manage severe hypocalcemia, severe hypobara, and this is your patient. So it's not a bendectomy. It's not even hysterectomy. Okay. We need our parathyroid killer. A question here, Dr. Amr. Is there any cutoff point for BTH to say after this, there is failure of medical treatment? Suppose that we give Senecal set or any calcium emetic and we reach the maximum tolerated dose and the BTH right. is very high above which, which cutoff point uh, you said it is failure of medical treatment? Very, very good question. So uh, the cutoff point, if you go back to the old textbook, we'll say more than 800, okay? This uh, target, or you know, it's, it's a moving target. So the cutoff point changes in the article that we published uh, a year or two ago, I think two years ago, we said maybe 1,200 at least, at least 1,200, okay? We are not talking about every single patient with more than 1,200 need to have parathyroid. Then you need to exhaust yourself, right? You need to give proper amount and dosing and duration of vitamin D analogs and uh, IV especially with, uh, you know, uh, calcium emetics. Now there is a trend in America that they even give the calcium emetics during the dialysis session, you know, the Sensibar or Sinacalcet or Mimbara. Yeah, they give it on, in the dialysis session. And as, as I mentioned, I discussed with Dr. Faisal Shaheen that now we have AP calcified, we have IV calcified. If you are the host to all of this, so the thing is, you, sometimes you say, okay, is it cheaper to do verified? It's not cheaper. And this is not, if you're taking a major organ, put, it, put in, uh, this organ in the craft, it's not cheap. You are taking a very valuable organ and you are just, you know, removing this, this gland. In the future, maybe in 15 years from now, might be we'll have better medication that you can control. But for this patient, it's a point of no return. You already took out their gland and you induce, you know, bone. So there is something in the medicine now, don't induce heart, right? Even if the patient has mild, you know, high barbara, moderate high barbara, and is he not compliant, not taking his medicine, not helping himself, I don't. I just want to do my, my job. I don't want to induce myself as a medical doctor, as a nephrologist or a surgeon to induce another disease by myself, not by the patient, okay? So I, I didn't say that there is no indication. There is good indication for parathyroidectomy, but it has to be done wise. I agree with the Dr. Tarat Antawi. We shouldn't have our patient an ugly face or we have a severe calciflexis. So uh, sometimes there is right. critical indications for parathyroidectomy. Uh, right, right. Yeah, okay. So this patient uh, high turnover bone disease, they fracture their bone, they have increased cardiovascular calcification, they die early, 
And uh, as, as, as Dr. Tari said, they, they look terrible. And uh, I, I have seen in, in Mansoura, you know, when I practice a lot of, you know, fracture, handicapped people, once they fracture, they are bedridden, mortality goes up, then the chances of refracture or, you know, DVTs or pulmonary embolism and immobilization and consequences of this immobilization on, you know, all their organs, including bone, is disaster. Yes, you need to treat that. If you fail the medical treatment, yes, you need to do the surgical treatment, but do, do the surgical treatment, you know, with your surgeon. Don't just send the patient to the surgeon, and especially if the surgeon just, uh, you know, most of the surgeons are more familiar how to treat primary hyperbaric. They take out the whole thing because they, this is a tumor, but in our patient, it's not a tumor. They started by having secondary hyperbaric as an adaptive mechanism, then now it's out of control, we just need to get it controlled, so try to be gentle. You know, get the BTH down to 300 level is fine. I, I tell you, majority, more than 90% of patients after baritidectomy, they have BTH less than 100, which is a problem. And if we activate prophylactic medicine to start earlier, and given even the conventional drug, it, the drugs will work. If we right. start with uh, the, in, the, with the uh, in early, it will work definitely. This is my mind to start earlier and to right. test uh, because so of the yes. receptor and, and the calcium center receptor are still active, but yes. later on they are severely down regulated, so you're wasting right. Uh, and, the, uh, and this is one of the cases that I'm going to dem demonstrate with the management of secondary hyperparathyroidism. It's very nice, uh, small review article in the CJS about uh, secondary hyperbara that it was treated successfully just by native vitamin D because they treat the patient in early stages of CKD and documented severe hypo vitaminosis D that improved by giving just a, uh, vitamin D3. Dr. This Faisal, is one of the main reason to establish CKD clinics yes. early before dialysis. Dialysis is just the tip of the iceberg. If you don't, you know, treat this patient early and you control their metabolic, you know, diseases, not only include the metabolic bone disease, but other diseases early, it's sometimes it's uh, very hard to do this later. Dr. Faisal, do you like to add anything? Yeah. Well, I, I think we have to look also uh, about the calcification of vessels as well, atherosclerosis, cardiac, uh, which we should follow regularly because this is a very important issue for, card, for mortality of the dialysis patient. Uh, so we are not looking for the bone only, we have to look for uh, overall visits and the cardiac especially and follow up this. And I think if, if we have someone with BTH is very high, is uh, not on, on treatment, not with treatment, uh, we cannot do anything with treatment. So we have to go further for surgery in order to prevent the cardiovascular disease and also bone disease. Right. Doctor, I I, I, but, but also we have, I think also we need to um, keep an eye on this patient after birth. I, I try okay. to establish this as some, you know, kind of a study with Mansoura, uh, you know, doing bone biopsy for this patient a year after birth and also check on their cardiovascular calcification. It didn't work very well, but I think you guys need to do that uh, either in Saudi Arabia or in Egypt. It's, it's very important to check on what will what happened to this patient after birth and if it's not the end of the story. Okay. Uh, we have a case, Dr. Amr, this is a 28-year-old male transplant, was transplanted since three years, and is maintained in steroid tacrolimus, uh, everolimus, and he was subject to parathyroidectomy uh, two years prior to transplantation. Currently, he has fracture, Calcium, phosphorus, medication, everything is fine, but creatine is two milligram per deciliter because he has repeated episodes of UTI. His basal creatine was 1.3, but currently it is two. Um, a fracture in the forearm. The plain x ray shows um, uh, the bone is uh, very bad, and we are, uh, we think of. Uh, DEXA and um, because uh, he was not uh, tested by DEXA before. Uh, so if, if we are in this case, 
brain X-ray showing osteoporosis, and this this means that the excess skin is very bad. And he is um, transplanted with grafts function, creating two means a symmetry of around 25 or 30 milliliter per minute. So uh, is there a rule for uh, uh, terebratide for treating this patient? Uh, but H is 25. It is uh, on the low normal range. Uh, what, what is your suggestion and recommendation for treating this patient? Yeah, very good. Again, it's, a, it's the same uh, problem, you know, high bubara and the low term, probably low term over from this 25 on the CTD stage. Uh, first of all, as you suggested, yes, we need to do DEXA scan. We need to comment on the bone uh, structure, bone quality and quantity, and we discussed that before. Then also we need to do markers because 25 was, uh, you know, this kind of CKD, of course it's low, but he is not dialysis patient, right? Huh. So if his dialysis vision was 25 of, of BTH and you said calcium phosphorus is okay, this is a straight, you know, most likely is, is, is hypopara and uh, low turnover for disease. But in the CKD stage, it might be confusing. So I would like to do, again, we don't want to shoot in the dark. We need to see something, you know, this is patient. 100% uh, have low turnover for disease or, you know, might have something different, might have osteomalacia, might have mixed, might have, you know, high turnover bone disease. So I like, um, as we discussed before, to do what we do is bone turnover biomarker, bone specific alkaline phosphate, or at least look for his total alkaline phosphate. I'm very sure that you have it. So if the BTH, uh, you know, is low and the total alkaline phosphate is very low, so that's, you know, most likely to be hypopara and low turnover bone disease. But if you find, as the case that we discussed, the alkaline phosphate is mismatched and the alkaline phosphate is high, or if you want to do bone specific, which is more sensitive, then we'll give you some information about the bone formation if it is very low. Um, and um, by the way, there is a slide by the end of my, my discussion. I, I don't, didn't uh, present that, but there is a way to, to do this according to the level that is algorithm. But I don't think we already are, you know, almost three hours now from our, you know, starting our presentation. So I don't want to go over this. But again, bone specific alkaline facility, trap 5B that give you information about the bone turnover. If both uh, the trap 5B is, is, is low and the bone formation biomarker is low, the bone specific alkaline facility is, was this BTH, low BTH? Yes, this uh, most likely has low turnover bone disease. You cannot swear that you do bone biopsy, but I know that, yeah. You know, problem doing bone biopsy, hopefully in the future, Manduh will learn it and uh, will can establish bone biopsy lab uh, in Mansoura. This would be a great achievement, and this is our target, to get somebody, you know, trainee or, or, or new, you know, junior doctor to learn how to do this and stabilize, you know, standardize and establish the lab. Then, yeah, if you can do that bone biopsy, definitely that would help to know exactly what's going on. If not, at least you have to be certain. Again, you're going to sterebaratide. How much does this cost? It's thousands of, of money, right? And you're going to give it for how long? At least a year or maybe two years, right? But so, it, is, it, I, it is a viable option here. I think this was right. it is. Definitely it is. Definitely uh -huh. if you are very certain that this patient has low turnover bone disease, Yes, it is. Osteoporotic, right. yes. Um, okay. So I'm, I have no words to say except to thank you very much, Professor Amr. It was very delicious. Thank you, uh, was, thank you for your invitation and helping was, me with the slides today. Was, was very fruitful and inspiring us for right. Right. very nice concepts. And uh, this right. will be the starting point to start a new journey because uh, we want to hear from you. Uh, more that about stone kidney disease. So I think probably the next session will be uh, medical management of the urinary stones, if you, if you don't mind. <laughs> uh, and this is the, um, uh, Dr. Tara Tantau is smiling. This means that he is very satisfied. Um, thank you very much, Professor Amr. And uh, inshallah, inshallah, tomorrow morning, the video will be uploaded to the YouTube before 10 a.m. Egyptian time. Okay. Sorry to be late. Uh, Dr. Faisal Shaheen wants to say goodbye. Uh, 
So the, uh, I, I'm going to uh, allow just Professor Shaheen to close okay. the meeting. Yes. Thank you Rob, very much. And I appreciate actually, we learn a lot today, especially the things which is not related to the medicine. So it is not company driven lecture. It is purely scientific lecture. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Uh, but uh, ju just a statement, all CME, uh, conducted by um, by SNT through me, it is non-company. Even if I present with companies, I do I didn't announce, and it is not included in our CME meetings. All CME uh, conducted by Egyptian sort of nephrology, and I am the moderator. It is free from any company uh, pressure or any sponsorship. No sponsorship. So I am glad to <laughs> and this is why Professor Amr uh, chair with us. <laughs> the other thing is, I like you know every single time I have any conversation or you know questions has been asked to me is about medicine. Mm -hmm. Guys, we are not a pharmacist. We are physician, and physician doesn't have to treat everything with a chem with chemicals and uh, you know with biological agents. We should be much smarter. We try to find the non biological intervention. We should find ways to get our patients, you know, more involved in their care. You know, be active, exercise, eat right. They say here in America, you are what you eat. You are what you do. So if you eat wrong, if you do something wrong, if you smoke, if you're lazy, if you're uh, you know, living sedentary life, you, you know, this will get you bad later on in your life. So hopefully we can focus on these natural intervention rather than you know, this uh, biological intervention and pharmaceutical. You know, we, are not, we don't work with pharmaceutical industry. Maybe if I'm getting money from pharmaceutical industry or if, if my talk is a sponsor or my visit is a sponsor and they are giving me, me money, I'll be biased. I <laughs> might be biased against them because maybe I'm, I'm not happy that they didn't give me money. <laughs> <laughs> Better to be you know, biased against, uh, you know, compared when I come and I visit Middle Eastern countries and I see, you know, a lot, you know, I, I don't want to say a lot, but some of people are just presenting, they are sponsored by pharmaceutical companies. You don't even disclose, you don't tell the audience that this, uh, this is, you know, talk or, 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 you know, presentation is sponsored by the company. It is unethical. Uh, it is unethical even if it is away from uh, pharmacological treatment. Uh, who, who will sponsor a big study that is not involved with pharmaceutical agents? They spend the millions of dollars on these biological, you know, agents. It seems that Professor Amr was targeted by companies. <laughs> Dr. Amr. Okay. Okay. So this is the end of the session. Thank you very much, Professor Amr, uh, for your patience with us. Thank you and goodbye.